join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the ozone layer and CFCs. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Today, it is well known that CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, can do immense damage to the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation from the sun. However, it was as recently as the mid-1970s when the connection between CFCs and ozone layer destruction was first established. The story starts back in 1957, when James Lovelock invented the electron capture detector. This is a machine that can detect very small amounts of a chemical compound in the atmosphere. Indeed, using the machine, it was Lovelock who was the first person to detect the widespread presence of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. In 1973, Lovelock, on a research trip which he'd funded himself, measured the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere in the Arctic and in Antarctica, but unfortunately came to the wrong conclusion that CFCs are not harmful to the environment. Following on from this work, though, in 1974, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published the very first scientific paper on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion. This quickly prompted the world's first ban on the use of CFCs which was enacted in 1975 by the U.S. state of Oregon. Further bans followed. In 1978, the United States and several European countries banned the use of CFCs in spray cans. CFCs were still allowed to be used, though, for refrigeration and in solvents. It was in the mid-1980s that scientists in Antarctica observed a huge depletion in the ozone layer above them often called the hole in the ozone layer. This led, in 1987, to the signing of the Montreal Protocol, which called for further reductions in the production and use of CFCs, and then, two years later, to a European Union agreement to ban the production of all CFCs by the end of the century. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So why exactly are CFCs so harmful? One of the reasons CFCs were so popular in the production of solvents and refrigeration coolants is that they are unreactive. That is, they don't react easily or at all with other chemical compounds. It's this property, however, that also makes them dangerous. Because they are unreactive, it's very difficult for them to be broken down. This gives them a long lifespan, more than 100 years in some cases, and allows them to rise into the upper levels of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, unchanged. There, ultraviolet radiation from the sun starts to break them down, freeing the chlorine atoms from the CFCs. It's this chlorine that helps destroy the ozone there. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a monologue about a guided tour to London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to... Hello, can I just have your attention for a minute? Thank you. My name is Mary Golding. Some of you may recognize me. I used to be a lecturer here at the college, but I changed jobs last year and now I work as the student officer. Okay, well, I'm in today to tell you about a guided tour that we've got going to um, London. Well, this will be a good chance for those of you who haven't been to London before to have a look at this beautiful city. I think those of you who come will thoroughly enjoy it. The trip is going to be for five days, from the 31st of March, which is a Saturday, to the 4th of April, the following Wednesday. We'll be taking a medium-sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. Last time it was a minibus with only 16 places, which proved insufficient for students' needs. According to the London Development Agency, London has over 200 museums, 500 cinema screens, 108 music halls, and five symphony orchestras. Needless to say, we can't see it all in one day. Here are some major sites we are going to tackle on the first visit to London. On the first day we're in London, we'll be going on a boat trip up the River Thames and up the London Eye. The Eye is a giant modern ferris wheel which stands on the south of the river across from the Houses of Parliament. The boat cruise is included in the cost of the trip, so you won't need to worry about spending extra money. But you have to pay to ride the Eye to gaze out over the vast city. After that, we'll visit the Houses of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament, also known as Westminster Palace, was designed in the Gothic style. One of London's famous landmarks, Big Ben, the clock tower named for its 13-ton bell, is also found here. You can have a free visit up there. I think you all know Westminster Abbey, one of the most visited Christian churches in the world. There is no admission charge for this, but there are lots of souvenir shops around, so you might need some money for those. On the second day, we'll be going to the British Museum. The oldest museum in the world is also the most visited site in London. You have to pay to get in there, but it's not expensive. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Also the most visited site in London. You have to pay to get in there, but it's not expensive. The museum's newly constructed £100 million Great Court, a two-acre square enclosed by a glass roof, is the largest covered public square in Europe. It is called the Great Court. On the third day, you'll be free to do whatever you like. Personally, I recommend the Natural History Museum. It has over 68 million specimens. Fun exhibits include the Blue Whale exhibit, Rainforest Gallery, Earthquake Experience, and Dinosaur Displays. 
The Globe Theatre is a place worthy of visiting. The original Globe Theatre, where actors performed William Shakespeare's plays, burned down in 1613. The newly reconstructed Globe, however, copies original drawings of the 16th century's building's details and uses many of the same techniques and materials. Theatregoers can see performances of Shakespeare's plays, such as Romeo and Juliet and Much Ado About Nothing. If you'd like, can you sign up on this form on the student notice board by Friday? It'll be first come, first served. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear an introduction about canoeing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Have you imagined paddling around on a river in a small boat? Canoes, which are narrow boats and usually hold one or two people at the most, are particularly well known for being unstable and turning over in the water. But more and more people enjoy this dangerous sport. Today, Cynthia Bocci an adult education teacher and an addict of canoeing as well will share her experience of canoeing with us. Cynthia, when did you begin this sport? Well, I started it six or seven years ago, and soon I got attracted by the exercise. I have to admit that it brings me great fun. It's become part of my life. So, could you describe how you do it? At first, I think you need some like-minded friends. The friends who share the same interest with you. It's no fun at all if you canoe alone. Usually we assemble in a parking shelter near the Island Lake Recreation Area. We pull our canoes from inside the vans, lift them from atop the cars and trucks, and attach wheels to help transport them to the shores of the lake beside the boat dock. What equipment do you need for the sport? Well, first and foremost, a canoe, of course. The price ranges from £300 to £700, depending on the material they're made from. The more you can pay, the better, really. Personally, I wouldn't look at anything under £500, but that obviously depends on your budget. You also need a hard helmet to protect yourself against rocks when you fall out of the canoe, and believe me, that is very likely to happen. Because of this, it's a must for a beginner to wear a wetsuit. Oh, bathing suits don't work, really. Sometimes a life jacket is a necessity, in case you fall into water and no one else is nearby. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Think it's all worth it? Absolutely. I just love it. It's exciting, exhilarating, yet it's peaceful and it's calm. You can work as hard as you want to or you can take it easy. In addition to having fun, canoeing offers a workout without realizing you're working out. 
Besides being a great exercise, which is good to heart and lungs, you gain strength and mobility. You build strength not only by paddling, but also from lifting and carrying your canoes. You can also exercise your mobility. Frankly, I never had upper body strength until I started canoeing. Now I can pick my canoe up and carry it on my shoulder with no problem. However, it's not just a workout of the upper body, but also a total body workout. If you're doing it correctly, it's a great calorie burner. And more important to me, paddling isn't strictly about exercise. It's as much about the peace and relaxation that comes from being out on the water. I saw it described on a brochure as liquid medicine for the soul, and that is so accurate. It allows you to take a mental break from your ordinary routine. It's a lot of fun, and you meet a lot of great people. We connect on the waterways by responding to email invitations, posting on websites, and club announcements. Also, it's a great way to get an up close view of nature. You can sneak up on wildlife. I've been right next to ducks, deer, and all kinds of birds. You just get a different view than you can get on land. I especially enjoy camping by canoe. It's like backpacking without having to carry a pack on your back. You can put everything you need in the hatches of the canoe. Have you experienced this kind of camping? Well, whatever you say about this sport, it's never dull. I think on one level it's a serious activity and you can become a real champion, but it's a small group who take it that far. But for most, it's a fantastic sport for anyone who likes adventure. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on wildlife. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Thousands of exotic plants and animals have been introduced into the British Isles over thousands of years. These newcomers compete with native species for resources and can also cause major changes in the wildlife and in the habitats of our countryside. The problem is not just British, of course, but global, and it has been going on for centuries. One good example of this I'd like to mention today is the European starling. The starling to us in the UK is a fairly ordinary little bird, about 12 inches long. In flight, it appears to be black or grey with tiny white spots. So it's a very ordinary-looking, almost dirty-looking bird. It nests in trees and buildings and can be found in the country and in towns. It travels in large flocks, leaving the nests in the morning and returning in the early evening. It feeds on insects and fruit. Its native range includes the British Isles and Finland, but it is also found in most of Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. In the British Isles and Finland, however, it has suffered a huge decline, and in these countries there is an effort to conserve the species. It is a different story in some of the places where it has been introduced. For example, the population in the USA is estimated at 170 million birds. Also, they are becoming a big problem in Australia and New Zealand. Starlings, as I have said, nest in trees, and it has been found that they are more aggressive than native species, native that is to Australia and New Zealand, when they are looking for nesting places. They therefore compete with native species for nests, and also they drive those species away from nests. So, 
This nest building activity causes harm to native species, but also they are a nuisance to humans. They gather in large flocks of thousands of birds and feed together on commercial crops. This causes great financial damage to farmers, and they also make a mess both in the town and the countryside. There is also the problem that starlings may carry diseases which affect both humans and other animals. Although this has not been really confirmed, and we are waiting for more work to be done on this, the question arises: What are we to do? About foreign species, which not only do damage to native species but interfere with human activity, we have three approaches in theory, but usually it is not a free choice between them. Usually we have to do the best we can and that money will allow. The best approach, of course, is prevention, and many countries have passed legislation which attempts to limit or prevent the arrival of non-native species in their countries. In particular, there are many international regulations on how and where ships may pick up and deposit water, and this is a major contribution to preventing the accidental transport of fish and organisms by ship. Since accidental transport by ship is a frequent cause of fish and other creatures going from place to place, ports also have special areas where water can be deposited, and many of them have treatment facilities to kill any foreign species that may establish themselves in their waters. For fish and organisms that live in water, these international regulations are useful. But obviously, not all species can be dealt with in this way. Sometimes it is simply too late for prevention. Then we have to consider eradication or management. By management, I mean that we have to decide how best to live with the new creatures and how to keep their numbers down. However, this becomes not only a scientific question. It can be a matter of choice what population level of an invasive species we want to maintain. This choice involves costs. There is the cost of living with the species, and there is the cost of managing the species over time. And species management is usually a long-term business without any foreseeable end. However, there is not just the economic aspect to this question. We can also consider the ethical point. How should we treat animals which we have sometimes deliberately introduced into the environment? Is it permissible just to exterminate a number of them convenient to ourselves? The most important decision has to be made in the political forum. Whatever considerations go into the making of that decision, these questions are relevant also to the approach of eradication, which is another option, but which does not have an encouraging history. Many attempts have been made to eradicate introduced species. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.